Good morning. My name is Ken Engelking, and it's so nice to be with you this morning. My wife and I, Lori, come to church here. We usually uh, come on Thursday night and sit up on the balcony, so nice to see you again, though. I want to say happy Father's Day to all the dads here, and can we just give them a round of applause? Being a dad is not easy, and this morning we want to do something just just to celebrate you dads just a little bit. So this is going to be out of your comfort zone for some of you. Um, But dads, could you take a, a moment and just stand to your feet and stay standing for just a second? Get a look at these studs right here. Fathers, dads, stepdads, single dads, great dads, okay dads, rad dads with bad, with rad dad with dad bods, or as Pastor Danny said, a father figure. All of us sort of have been on this journey for many of you for a very long time. How many grandfathers out here? Let me see. Nice. We graduated up, right? I I know sometimes we wish that we could change a few things, and I know sometimes we look back, and even all of us sitting here, we do have mixed emotions on this day, because maybe there's, um, for all of us, a father that we can't wish Happy Father's Day to because they're gone, or there's there's problems, or and we we know that. But this morning we want to celebrate you. And so what we want to do is pray. So all the rest of you, why don't you stand up and make sure that every dad has someone that you could put their hand, put your hand on their shoulder, surround them, right? Make sure no dad is here that's not have someone praying with them or you can stretch your hand out. And we want to bless every father here. I think everybody's covered. So let's just, let's just say a prayer for these fathers, shall we? Together, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, and we thank you for every man, every father that's in this room, and thank you, Father, for their journey and their life that got to this place, and Lord, we want to recognize that um, being a dad is such a privilege, but it's also not easy, and Lord, not one of us is perfect. So sometimes, Father, these dads feel... um, Like they wish they could go back and do things over and sometimes they're just so caught up in the moment. But Father, no matter where they are, I pray today would be a moment of blessing to them. And we thank you for them. We pray, Lord, that no matter where they are in their dad journey, that you would increase their faith and increase their effectiveness and prepare them for what's ahead. And we thank you for them. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Not only do you get a blessing, Dad, but you get a free donut after church, so. How many of you uh, would go back if you could and do some things over as a dad or as a mom for that matter? We live life with a certain amount of regrets, I know. I celebrated, um, my wife and I, Lori, she's up there, she cel- we celebrated 37 years being married this last month, or this month actually. And whatever I have on the dad card is because my wife was such a great partner with me and um, raising three sons was really just one of the greatest things in my life. And for the last month, I, I do have reflected on some regrets and because of that, I started listening to sad dad songs. You guys know these songs? My son turned 10 just the other day. He said, thanks for the ball. Come on, Dad, let's play. Can it teach me to throw? I said, not today. I got a lot to do. He said, that's okay. And as he walked away, his smile never dimmed. He said, I'm going to be like him. You know that song? Sing it with me. And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon. Let me hear it. Little boy blue and the man on the moon. When you coming home, son, I don't know when. We'll get together then. 
you know we'll have a good time then. Yeah, so I got you in the mood, right? I mean, there are so many things in our life that remind us of fathers and today is going to be no different when we talk about fathers and forgiveness in the midst of our series on forgiveness. This is week three, by the way. I was reminded earlier this about a story that Ernest Hemingway told in a book called The Capital of the World. And he told the story of a father and his teenage son and the son had sinned against the dad. And in his shame, he ran away from home. The father searched all over Spain for him, but he still could not find the boy. And finally, in the city of Madrid, in a last desperate attempt to find his son, the father placed an ad in the daily newspaper. And the ad read, Paco, meet me at the Hotel Montaña, noon Tuesday. All is forgiven, Papa. So the father prayed that maybe his son... Paco would find that ad and see it and read it and maybe he would come to the hotel. And on Tuesday afternoon, the father in the story arrived at the hotel and he could not believe his eyes. There was a whole squadron of police officers. They've been called out to keep order among the 800 Pacos <laughs> that showed up to seek forgiveness and restoration to their father. And perhaps you too, you have your own dad story and you have the things in your life that bring joy and maybe bring some hurt. And while we realize that our dads aren't perfect, there is a passage in the Bible where Jesus tells a story about the most outrageous dad in the world. And we're going to study that story today. It's in Luke 15. If you have your Bible, you could turn there or your phone or your, you can look up on the screen, but We'll start out reading this story, Luke, Luke 15, verses 11. He said, and he meaning Jesus, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and he took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. So as we take a fresh look at this story, there's a couple things that we should consider. One is that, well, who is Jesus telling this story to? Well, there's two groups of people, Luke tells us, that are listening to the story. One is a group of Pharisees and scribes. So they were religious people and um, they knew everything about the law and they knew everything about um, the commandments and they even made up some stuff about the commandments. So they would be sure just by being perfect that they would assure that they would be loved by God and accepted by God. And also in the story, at the telling of the story, was it, were a group of what the Bible calls sinners. And these were sinners who Jesus had been spending time with. And in fact, Jesus was accused often of spending time with sinners because the religious people didn't think that a good teacher and a good prophet would be spending time with sinners. But Jesus spent time with sinners, so much so that he was accused of all sorts of things. But Jesus spent time with the sinners and the sinners are listening to this story and the Pharisees are listening to this story. And this was actually, in the telling of the story, Jesus told three parables, right? So the, the story of the prodigal son is the last one. The first one was this. So he told them this parable, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that has lost until he finds it. 
And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. And now Jesus tells them what the parable means. He said, Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And here Jesus is really giving it to the Pharisees because they thought that because of the way that they lived and the rules that they kept, that they were going to make it to heaven. So Jesus was kind of pointing them out early that they didn't think that they needed to be saved, that they didn't need to repent, and that God only loves us when we're perfect. So therefore, we have to sort of earn God's love. That's what they were in the thought. That was their thought train. Then Jesus tells another story in that same sitting and he said, or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So you can see the line of thinking that Jesus has going here. He emphasizes that heaven rejoices over one sinner who repents. If I were to take, to talk about repentance, a prominent Old Testament word and a New Testament word on repentance, repentance would look like this. Repentance is when we turn to God and we change our mind. Another way to look at it is we, we change our mind and then we turn to God. And I wouldn't get caught up on the order because people would disagree with you on it. But for the most part, repentance means those two things. And it's sort of a spiritual and mystical combination between the two. Repentance is something that we do when we get things right with the Lord. And all these things in our life sort of come together. And sometimes we see that we're going in the wrong direction. And we see that, and then we decide, I've got to get back towards the Lord. And so we turn around, and as we begin walking back towards the Lord, we realize sometimes in that journey, all the things that we were doing that weren't good and that kept us away from the Lord. Or sometimes we have that, that idea that we are just going to, uh, we look at our life, maybe where we are, and we wonder, how did I get here? I used to be someplace else entirely, and now I'm caught up in this lifestyle or the sin that's not at all what I want and so you decide based on your surroundings and your behaviors like I, I got to get back to the Lord and in fact maybe some of you are in the here at church today because you've been thinking man I got to get right with the Lord and I guess I'll start I'll start by going to church and which is great and so you see your life and then you start turning back to God and so repentance in my mind is a journey and it's a, it's a daily pivot. It's a daily alignment that we wake up and realize that because God's mercies are new every morning, I might as well get up and make sure that I'm going the Lord's way, the, the way that God wants me to go. Repentance is something that we sort of live in that state of wanting to align ourselves that way. So when Jesus talks, was telling this story about repentance, he was explaining to the Pharisees especially, hey, anyone can repent even the sinners. And when the sinners repent, the angels just explode with joy and, and happiness because of what happens. There's a verse in Romans 2 that says, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from sin? Or another translation would say, don't you understand that it is God's kindness that leads us to repentance? And that is so true because when we know how good God is and when we think about it, when we don't ignore it, we realize, oh my goodness, God forgives me and I want to walk with him. So repentance is that. Repentance is something that we do as God leads, but forgiveness is something that God does. Only God can forgive. 
Only God can forgive our sins is what I meant to say. So back to this dad's story. There was a dad that had two sons. One son asked for half the estate. Absurd. Never done. By the way, Jesus begins to tell the story. And already when he gets to the first description of the son, the Pharisees already hate him. Because he said, I want mine right now. So all of a sudden we realize the first thing is that this kid, this prodigal son is a spoiled brat. Is anyone here know a spoiled brat? Yeah, and you're pointing. Thanks, helpful. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was thinking too. I didn't want to say it, but. But starting with this bit about the inheritance, Jesus begins to paint this picture of the worst son imaginable, especially to the religious people who were following Judaism in this culture. This shouldn't be missed. Jesus is telling a story about the all time worst son imaginable and he continues to tell about this son to the religious this son is horrendous to the sinners he's got street cred he's like yeah I get that guy he tells them he demanded his early inheritance so he's very very selfish did anybody here selfish anybody know someone selfish he left his job in the family business, so he became very irresponsible. Anybody here ever done anything irresponsible? Yes, daily, right? <laughs> I, won't, I won't keep asking you to raise your hand, although it'd be funner if we did. But the Bible says that then after um, that, he went to faraway places. He went to a sketchy place. He was a passport bro going to forbidden places. Anyone intentionally been in the wrong place at the wrong time? The lady with the pink hair. <laughs> been there, done that. Thank you for your honor. Anyone that knows the words, the cats in the cradle, means you grew up in the 70s and the 80s. So you probably have been in the wrong place at the wrong time. And you knew you were going there when you went there. He squandered all his money. So irresponsible. He had so much money to start. And he spent it on anything he wanted. Foolish. Reckless. Wasteful. For a long time, he just squandered this money. The, the text says he spent his money on um, reckless living. It makes you wonder what that was, right? Another version says wild living or riotous living. Anyone here been a part of that in your life probably so and you can see the Jewish leaders they hate him they're repulsed by this prodigal son and the sinners are wondering if they maybe they know this guy the sinners are thinking been there done that but the religious people are seething with hate the story goes on, as Jesus told the story, that there was a natural disaster that caused an economic downturn, and then there was a famine. So all of a sudden, you couldn't afford to live. Gas was $5 a gallon. <laughs> a cup of coffee was five bucks. A Burgerville cheeseburger was five bucks. No financial plan, no passive income, no 401k, not even a side hustle. And this guy is just becoming the biggest loser imaginable. And then it says that he took a job with a Gentile, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but to a religious Jew, it was a big deal. It was a horrible decision in that Jewish culture at that time. He did something that others didn't approve of. And then he took a job and his job was feeding pigs. And to a religious Jew, a pig was a filthy animal. You didn't eat it and you never would have worked with one. You'd never be around him. You'd never take a job where you were feeding the pigs. It was the worst, lowest job imaginable. And you could kind of see at this point, you're thinking, huh, Jesus is really making this guy to be out to be a really bad guy. And the reaction from the Pharisees and the reaction from the sinners must have been great to see the looks on their faces. So there he is feeding the pigs and Jesus is telling this story with every carefully crafted word of this tale. The sinners and the Pharisees were reeled in by Jesus. The Jews hated him 
And even the sinners are having second thoughts at this point. It says, finally, he was so poor, so destitute, so hungry, and so disgraced that he looked at the food that he was feeding the pigs and thought, man, it may not be a Burgerville cheeseburger, but man, it sure, it sure looks good. No one gave him anything, it says. He had hit rock bottom. He had hit rock bottom, and I know that some of you know what that feels like. So the story goes, as Jesus describes this prodigal son, that he, he came to his senses. He thought, I think if I went back home, if my dad would take me back home, that at least I could get a job as a hired hand. I'm pretty sure he'd hire me back because the food that he feeds the ranch hands with is way better than what I am eating. So he decides to go back and he leaves the Badlands and he makes his way home. By the way, we, we, you know, the, the writers, the translators, whoever just call the story the prodigal son because prodigal means extravagant or a lot or extra or lavish. In other words, the prodigal son was extra, extra, extra bad. But the prodigal son, the word prodigal could also be used for the father because the father was extra, extra, extra good. He was lavish. And we're going to meet the father as Jesus continues the story. He now brings in the father who divided his inheritance and has been standing by. What has the father been doing? Well, the text says in verse 20, that he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. We've heard the story before. A lot of us have, maybe not all of us. The Jews haven't, the religious people hadn't heard the story. But when Jesus says that the father was waiting for him, oh my word. They could not handle that, that the father would be waiting. And it looks like he was. It says the father was waiting. His father saw him and felt compassion. He was waiting a long time. And if you follow the story, he was waiting through the departure and through the, the reckless living. His father was waiting and watching while he went off to a foreign land. He was waiting and watching while he had squandered all that he had. Waiting and watching while he went to do things that would have brought a lot of humility and um, disgrace to not just the prodigal son, but to his whole family. That son did some things, but yet the father we read in the text, Jesus tells the story that, remember, Jesus is introducing us to the heart of God here. He's telling us what God is like. He said he was waiting and watching. And it reminded me of this verse in Isaiah that says, therefore, the Lord waits to be gracious to you. And therefore, he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is the God of justice and blessed are those who wait for him. In Psalm, it says, the Lord is merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. So here is Jesus telling us about the nature and the character of God, that he is a loving God who's patient and full of grace, wanting to forgive, wanting to show kindness to who would ever want to walk and follow after him. That was a story for the prodigal son, but trust me, that is a story for you and that is a story for me. God is on our side. He's for us. He's waiting and watching. Waiting us to walk around that long road that we've been on for a long time to come towards him. And he's waiting and watching with the patience that only God can have in a kindness. It says that while he's still a long ways off, his father saw him and he had compassion and felt compassion the word that Jesus used here 
for compassion is a word when translated, it's a word that has to do with the study of your gut. In other words, compassion is a word that means I felt strongly and I felt it in my gut. You know, it's a strong word that you feel it. So when you feel something really strong, we've all had this in our life before, you feel it. It just, it either hurts or it affects us and we feel it so strongly that it moves us to action. It's the same word that was used when uh, the Gospels tells us that Jesus saw the 5,000 and, and felt compassion for them and, he, and so then he fed them. It's the same word because it's a, it's a word for compassion that means that it moves us to action. It says that the Father felt the compassion. One version says that the Father was filled with love and compassion. <laughs> what, a, what a great picture that Jesus is painting of his Father and our Father. The Father was filled with love and compassion and the next thing that happened was just sort of scandalous. And it says that the Father ran to a son. Now, we, we've seen that image in many shows or whatever. We, we can understand running to someone that you miss. In this culture, running was so out of character for a distinguished elderly gentleman. It didn't happen because it was embarrassing. It would have brought dishonor to his whole family. I don't think sure all the reasons why, but old dads didn't run. Okay, old dads didn't run. That's why I don't run. I walk. <laughs> I think part of it has to do with these tunics that they wore, you know, these long robes. And they, what I read is that they'd have to sort of squat down and grab these garments and kind of pull them up between their legs and kind of tie them so it looked like they were wearing a big baby diaper, right? So you're kind of running, you know. You ever seen someone run that their pants won't stay up? Yeah. It's just awkward, you know. Just Well, they're, they're running, and it just, for whatever reason, culturally, it was the wrong thing to do. And, and it was so bad that at this point, the, um, the Pharisees listening to the story, man, they would have just lost their ever-loving mind at the picture of this dad seeing his son from a long ways off having compassion and start booking down the road so he could see his son faster what's he going to do he ran to his son and then it says while he was a long ways off he ran and then he embraced his son and kissed him everybody's losing their minds here in this story. I don't know what the son was expecting um, in this moment, but Jesus paints this picture that's pretty amazing. The listeners here at this site were just wondering who is this God that would do that? And when they have this conversation where when the father finally meets the son, there isn't a lecture there's no shade thrown, there's no hate, there's nothing but love and compassion. And I just wonder what that embrace might have felt like. The kissing is a cultural thing, right? That's why I hear you, I want to see you nod your head because the kissing would make me uncomfortable if we still live in a society where dudes kissed each other as a sign of a greeting. A hug is okay, especially if it's a bro hug. You know, ladies, you've probably noticed this, but guys don't love hugging each other. It's just not really the thing that we like to do. We've invented a thing that if someone's approaching and you're, you're concerned that a hug might be involved, you kind of slow down a little bit. You, you test the water with your handshake, right? You shake that hand. And then if one of you is kind of feeling the, the love, you know, with that hand, you kind of pull in, Right? And you do this, right? It's just a quick movement. It's a handshake. Oh, warm greeting. And then here. But at that point, we start losing our minds. So we give a pat on the back. Okay? So we do like this. We pat, which means, hey, this hug is over. We're done. We went beyond, we went beyond what we usually do. And if some guy wants to let that hug linger, you give a double pat. It means, all right. We're done, big guy. And then that's over. If you need to make someone feel awkward, bring that hug in, 
especially to a strange guy. He won't like you. Don't kiss him because that would lead to violence probably. I don't know what that hug must have been like. Um, I don't know what it, what, it, what it must have been. The truth is, I, I personally, I don't remember a lot of hugs from dad when I was growing up or stepdad. That was something that wasn't really the part of my growing up. For whatever reason, it's a long story, but it, it, it wasn't it. And so when I became a dad, I was set in my mind, I was going to be a dad that hugged. And I, I actually, for a while, was all about the hug and the kiss for pretty much as long as I could until they would have none of it anymore. But, and I still do, I still like to hug my sons because it was something that I really didn't, I didn't really have and I wanted them to know because I've always thought there was something powerful about an embrace of a father. And I was reminded uh, recently from my wife, Lori, about a, something that happened in our, in our family. And that is, um, this is in December of 2020. And we were there at my house, my wife, Lori, and I, and our son, Jackson. Jackson was in his mid-20s and he was quarantining with us. And while we had many good memories of that time, Jackson was going through a divorce, um, a divorce with his high school sweetheart, and he, he didn't want it. No one wanted it, man, but we were hurting. We were hurting, and we were sitting there in the living room, and Jackson on that night on Christmas Eve just lied on the rug in front of the fireplace at our house. And he said, why does this hurt so much? Dad, you can't fix everything. <laughs> Moms can't fix everything. And Lori reminded me recently of what I did. And that is I, I got up and I went over to him as he was lying there. Lori said I kind of went down on the ground and I kind of wrapped him up with my arms and kind of laid on him and I squeezed him and I wanted him to know he was not alone I wanted him to know he was going to be okay I didn't have any words to say I didn't have any advice but I wanted him to know in that embrace that I loved him and that he was going to be okay maybe you've got a hug like that before I've also been the person on the floor <laughs> needing the hug, just leveled by my own shame and guilt where I knew I needed a hug that showed me the forgiveness. Listen to the words of this song and find in there, find in this song that we're going to do for you now. One lyric I like, it says, I was once a prodigal, burdened by my shame, till you came running to remind me of your love. Let's listen to this. the 
His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. Kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with the feast. For the son of mine was dead and is now returned to life. He was lost, and now he is found. So the party began. <laughs> you know, the Bible says that all of us, like sheep, have gone astray, and each one of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. The Bible tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and, fame, and, and forgave our sins. Perhaps you are here today because you need to be reconciled with your father and experience the Father's embrace. And I would encourage you this morning, if that's you, to spend some time, talk to someone, and maybe in a minute we'll just pray and you could voice that to the Lord. If your journey of repentance has brought you to church today, then I pray that you would find a renewed love, 
um, and strength in knowing that God's kindness brings us to him. And he is so good to you and he's been so good to me. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your goodness. And we just simply couldn't do enough, Lord, to bring ourselves to you and bring ourselves to heaven. So you made a way. You made a way in the atonement, in the death of your son Jesus on a cross. You made a way for us to come to you. And you drew us in, Lord, with your love and your kindness. And Lord, you've waited and you've been patient. And you wrap us up in your love and your embrace. So Lord, we, we receive that today. We want to absorb it. And we want to pass it on. Lord, thank you for your goodness and for one, your wonderful love for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.